Welcome, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Excellent. Uh, well, thanks for joining us this evening. My name is Jack Mulder. I teach philosophy at Hope College, uh, and I'm the assistant director and co-founder of the St. Benedict Institute. Uh, St. Benedict Institute, in case you don't know, is the Catholic intellectual and spiritual institute that serves Hope College. It's a ministry of St. Francis de Sales Catholic Church in Holland, and it aims to bring a distinctively Catholic voice to Hope College. Well, we live in a time when there are significant debates about how far something like religious freedom extends and what it might mean. Uh, as John Corvino, Ryan T. Anderson, and Sharif Gurgis uh, write in their book, Debating Religious Liberty and Discrimination, just about everybody claims to be pro-tolerance and anti-bigotry. But the devil is in the details. Right? Nevertheless, the free exercise of one's religious faith is a fundamental American liberty. It's provided for in the First Amendment. Surprisingly enough, though, some of the most difficult battles that are being waged now for religious freedom are those that pertain to health care and the unique needs, obligations, and privileges of patients and practitioners alike. Today, we welcome Mr. Lewis Brown to give us a sense of what the crisis of religious freedom is in contemporary health care and how we might approach it. Mr. Brown is the executive director of the Christ Medicus Foundation, a Catholic healthcare nonprofit whose mission is to share the healing love of Jesus Christ in healthcare. Uh, Mr. Brown received a Juris Doctorate from Howard University School of Law in Washington, D.C. He's active with several organizations and universities in the defense of religious liberty. And please join me tonight in welcoming Mr. Lewis Brown. Can you all hear me? Yeah, it's working. OK, I got that right. Great. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you all. Um, and I've just really enjoyed my time here just in the last, uh, it's not even been maybe about 48 hours. But I'm originally from uh, Oakland County, uh, Michigan. And so I'm, in many ways, a Michigander. Y you too. OK, very good. And so it's been great. I haven't, I probably, I, I did policy debate in high school. And Holland High School had a good debate team. And they had a debate tournament. And I probably haven't been here since like 1998 or something like that. So uh, it's great to be with you. Uh, I want to thank the Benedictine Institute. I want to thank uh, uh, Professor Mulder, who I had a great conversation with on the ride over. He's outstanding. I want to thank uh, uh, Deacon Brian Pycook, P. Cook, uh, who is outstanding. We had a conversation um, last spring, and I was overjoyed to hear about the St. Benedictine Institute here at Hope College. It's very uh, rare. It's all too rare to have these kind of institutions uh, in and around places of higher learning in the United States. Uh, it reminds me of the great work at the Catholic Information Center in Washington, D.C., which is a lifeblood of community and intellectual thought and formation, uh, not just for the Catholic community in DC, but really for the whole country. And also made me think about the wonderful work that Father Dominic Legg at the Thomistic Institute, uh, a Dominican, I love the Dominicans, uh, is doing. So thank you to the St. Uh, Benedict Institute. I also want to thank Professor uh, Jared Ortiz in the back. And I just feel like yeah, I just was so, I can't tell you the enthusiasm and joy I had talking to both of, actually all three of these men uh, on kind of the process here because it felt like I was with uh, kindred spirits. I took a morning run this morning around uh, Hope College and didn't go nearly as quick as I wish I would have, but you all have a beautiful uh, college here and my first time really seeing it. Um, so a blessing to, to be with you, a blessing to speak with you on this topic of religious freedom and the crisis uh, in contemporary healthcare. Um, my goal is to be an instrument of God's love for you and the articulation uh, of this message. And uh, anything that is wrong is my fault. I always say this. Anything that is good is all the Lord. And since we're at a Christian uh, college, I'm going to begin uh, with a prayer and, and just a prayer of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. I pray, come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in us the fire of your love. 
Send forth your spirit, and we shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. I also hope that this talk will benefit all of us, uh, all of you all, hopefully, to some extent, in your personal and professional vocations and in the exercise of your civic duties uh, and responsibilities uh, as citizens, as we are all uh, called to be. I'm blessed through God's love and mercy to serve as the executive director, as uh, Professor Mulder said, of the Christ Medicus Foundation, to Catholic healthcare nonprofit, our mission to share the healing love of Christ in healthcare. Our team accomplishes this mission of sharing the healing love of Christ in healthcare chiefly in three ways. The first way is promoting the sanctity of all human life and the civil rights of religious freedom and medical conscience. The second way is by guiding and working to expand pro-life Catholic medical centers. And the third way we seek to share the healing love of Christ in healthcare is by providing our Curo healthcare community in which individuals and families across the country in over 40 states, they share their medical cost and they grow, we hope, through God's mercy, they grow in whole person wellness through Catholic health coaching, through spiritual direction, and through our spiritual health program. I'm blessed to be Catholic, and I believe with all that I know that the Catholic faith is the fullness of the Christian path to Jesus Christ, who is love, mercy, healing, uh, and liberation uh, itself. Tonight, I'm gonna speak with you about what I see as the crisis in our modern American healthcare system and how this crisis in part came to be. I will then speak with you about solutions, just a few small solutions for helping to restore our country's healthcare system to its true foundation. Our country's healthcare system, true foundation, is found in the belief and in the practice of the love of God and neighbor in which we are morally obligated to protect and respect the life and dignity and health of all human life. This crisis in contemporary healthcare is in part illustrated by two true stories with which I have become familiar and want to tell you about today. The first story involves an African-American single mother and her child who shortly after birth experienced a serious medical incident. Thankfully, the baby was taken to a medical facility with the medical and technological ability to care for the child in this baby's condition. The baby survived the initial incident, uh, but continued with very serious medical needs. However, in my opinion, at times, this baby at this medical facility did not receive the care that the baby deserved. In my estimation, it did not help that the mother of this baby was a single mom. And it did not help that the mother and baby were both African American. In my view, because the baby had what amounted to a life-threatening disability, and because the mother was a single black woman of limited financial resources, the medical facility did not provide the baby the care the child deserved. Furthermore, while some of the medical staff, in my opinion, were outstanding, others on the medical team showed, again, my opinion, what appeared to be a lack of respect for this single mother who was heroically, and I mean heroically, sacrificing for her child's life. In my opinion, again, some of the medical staff treatment suggested that they believed the child's life was not deserving of the highest quality of care because of this child's disabilities. Allow me to tell you another story. An African-American woman of advanced years was a patient in a medical system due to her very serious health issues. The patient's sister had a power of attorney and was reportedly the primary giver, caregiver and the primary decision maker about her sister's care. In part due to conflict with the patient's sister and the medical system about the patient's care, the medical system at least part of it, pursued legal guardianship over the patient. The medical facility obtained legal guardianship of the patient through a state court order. The medical facility's legal guardianship gave the medical facility the authority to determine the patient's medical care. 
according to the sister's account, which I find credible, eventually the medical system exercised their legal guardianship over the patient and decided, according to the sister, to withdraw nutri nutrition and hydration from the patient, thereby allowing the patient to pass away. To put a fine point on it, and based on the sister's account, this medical system usurped the just and legitimate right of the patient's family to control the patient's care, and then used their legal guardianship to remove hydration and nutrition. The lawyer for the medical system had the audacity to send the patient's sister a chilling email based on what I believe to be true, one of the most awful emails I have read, informing the sister of the medical system's decision about the patient, her beloved sister. The medical system involved here robbed the sister of her just and legitimate role in determining her sister's care, in my opinion. Too often, based on my experience, which is limited, I, I give you that, but too often, based on my experience, disproportionately, chronically and terminally ill patients and families who are African American and who do not have social status or do not have significant financial resources, these folks, too often, disproportionately, are deprived of the respect and care that they deserve. These two stories illustrate, to me, the crisis in contemporary healthcare. And unfortunately, these stories involving real people and real lives are all too common in America. The crisis today in healthcare, above all else, is the disregard or at times outright hostility to the sanctity of all human life and an erosion of the moral and religious convictions in medicine that are the pillars of human dignity. Regardless of a patient's stage of development, unborn or born, regardless of a patient's condition, regardless of a patient's disabilities, and regardless of a patient's race, color, or socioeconomic status, every patient, every patient, we know this by truth, this is not just mere religious conviction, even reason gets us there. Every patient is a human being whose life, health, and well-being is sacred and invaluable. The American healthcare system, doctors, nurses, hospitals, and healthcare entities have a moral obligation to safeguard the sacred dignity of the life and health of every patient, including the weak and vulnerable, and they have that moral obligation from conception to natural death. Tragically, the prevailing laws, regulations, and ethics that govern the healthcare system too often, not all the time, but too often, fail to protect the life and health of the most vulnerable patients. Who are we talking about? We're talking about unborn children. We're talking about newborn children with serious disabilities. We're talking about patients who are materially poor with serious medical conditions. We're also talking about patients who are racial minorities and older, now called regularly aged patients with chronic and terminal conditions. Before I go further, it's important to note that I believe, and I really believe this, the overwhelming majority of medical professionals are good people with good intentions who are working hard and sacrificing a lot often to care for the sick and suffering across the country. I think that's true. Our medical professionals care for and save countless lives every year. And they are clearly gifts of God. Their life-saving work is a gift of God, a blessing. However, the principle of the dignity and sanctity of all human life and health care is increasingly collapsing in our laws and our regulations that govern health care. The principle of human dignity is collapsing in the medical licensing bodies and medical associations that largely determine the standards of medical care in our country. And the principle of human dignity is increasingly collapsing because of a growing body of federal and state public policy and secular medical ethics that reject the human dignity of patients when they become, quote unquote, inconvenient. This growing body of public policy and medical ethics rejects medical conscience and religious freedom rights 
and seeks to remove love as the primary motive of healthcare and replace it with monetary profit motive. This growing body of public policy and secular medical ethics rejects often, not all the time, but often, the biological scientific reality of human life. This growing body of public policy and secular ethics is hostile to the most physically weak human beings. It often treats unproductive patients as disposable and in effect says too often that our American healthcare system should favor the strong, fit, and productive. Yes, we live in America. We still live in America, and there are many outstanding things to celebrate within the American healthcare system. And so many medical professionals and hospitals, again, heroically sacrifice so much to save lives, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic. However, nonetheless, this throwaway culture in America, American healthcare is growing. It's effectively saying that sometimes it's permissible to discriminate against infants with serious disabilities. It's okay to discriminate against patients who are seriously sick and materially poor. It's okay to have bias or deny, unjustly deny care to patients who are black and Latino. It's okay to discriminate or unjustly deny care to patients who are sick and elderly or patients who are weak and unproductive. And in the case of the, um, of the unborn, our American healthcare system increasingly is saying that it is permissible or even necessary or even just, falsely saying it is just, to intentionally kill millions of unborn children. These things are all connected. The moral issue of our time in healthcare is this. Will America, will America protect the moral, biological, scientific reality of the equal dignity of every human life from conception to natural death? Again, my friends, our dignity and our rights are all connected. The abortive mindset, which is what I call this, called a throwaway culture or the culture of death and the abortive mindset, it says that it's, it's permissible to intentionally kill unborn children and to harm their pregnant mothers. And it's the same abortive mindset that says it's permissible to deny medical care to the disabled, to poor black patients, to chronically ill elderly patients, to poor patients who are immigrants. This abortive mindset says that some human beings are disposable. It's not only devastating for unborn children and their mothers, but it is increasingly devastating more and more for the physically vulnerable and for the materially born, materially poor who are born. In the eyes of the world, this growing abortive culture in healthcare believes that these patients are unproductive, unworthy, and at times unnecessary. This abortive mindset in the healthcare system is eroding the right to life of all patients, not just the unborn. It's eroding the protection of civil rights in healthcare, and it's undermining the life and health and well being of all patients in America, either directly or indirectly. You cannot, many have said this, this is not original thought, many have said this, you cannot exclude one class of human beings, the unborn, kill millions in the womb, and expect that such a moral atrocity will not hurt other vulnerable members of society as well. The support of abortion, again, the intentional killing of unborn children in the healthcare industry, is directly contributing to the discrimination and dehumanization of, of other vulnerable patients. If we say in healthcare that it's permissible to kill unborn children who are clearly human beings based on the scientific biological reality, we are also justifying the dehumanization, discrimination, and even the euthanizing of other so-called undesirables in our society who are also viewed as unwanted, unproductive, and unnecessary. So how do we get here? How do we get to this growing throwaway culture in health healthcare that it's grown to such tragic heights? And it's important to say, I'm not saying this is the entire healthcare industry, but it is on the move and it's not being checked, not sufficiently.
And, and one last thing, as I go into what I'm about to go into, um, there are certain parallels to the 20th century. We're not there yet. It's not a direct comparison. But there are lessons that we can learn from the 20th century that can help us to avoid the pitfalls of the past. And that's what I'm going to share with you now. Dr. Leo Alexander was a medical doctor that served as a consultant to the U.S. Army at the Nuremberg War Crimes Tribunals uh, in the 40s. He studied the evil that occurred in the medical system in Germany under the evil, immoral Nazi regime. He published a paper of his observations in 1949 in the New England Journal of Medicine that he intended to be a warning to the American medical community. Dr. Alexander also asserted that a substantial part of the collapse of the German medical system was initially, and I quote, a growing acceptance of the attitude of physicians, basic in the euthanasia movement, that there is such a thing as a life not worthy to be lived. This attitude, I'm still quoting Alexander here, this attitude in the early stages concerned itself merely with the severely and chronically sick. Alexander continues, gradually the sphere of those included in this category was enlarged to encompass the socially unproductive, the ideologically unwanted, the racially unwanted, and finally all non-Germans. Alexander continues, but it is important to realize that the infinitely small wedged in lever from which this entire trend of mind received its impetus was the attitude towards the non-rehabilitatable. Dr. Alexander continues, quote, the original concept of medicine and nursing was not based on any rational or feasible likelihood that they could actually cure and restore, but rather on an essentially maternal and religious or religious idea. The good Samaritan had no thought, nor did he actually care whether he could restore working capacity. This is all Alexander. He continues, he was merely, talking about the Good Samaritan, he was merely motivated by the compassion of alleviating suffering. Alexander continues a little bit later. Gradually, in all civilized countries, medicine has moved away from this position. Strangely enough, in direct proportion to man's actual ability to perform feats that would have been plain miracles in the days of old. Alexander continues. However, with this increased efficiency based on scientific development went a subtle change in attitude. Alexander continues, physicians have come dangerously close to being mere technicians of rehabilitation. This essentially Hegelian rational attitude has led them to make certain distinctions in the handling of acute and chronic diseases. The patient with the latter, referring to the, the chronic diseases, the patient with the latter carries an obvious stigma as the one less likely to be fully rehabilitable for social usefulness. In an increasingly utilitarian society, these patients are being looked down upon with increasing definitiveness as unwanted ballast. A certain amount of rather open content for the people who cannot be rehabilitated were present with present knowledge has developed. This is probably due to a good deal of unconscious hostility because these people for whom there seem to be no effective remedies have become a threat to newly acquired delusions of omnipotence. This is largely where we are today. It is stunning. I, I sat there at HHS in my office with a, another old civil rights veteran who'd worked at justice in HHS. We both read this published article and said, oh my God, this has happened. One last quote from Alexander, because this is so key to what I'm trying to present. So forgive me for quoting so much, but I, I pray that you can follow and I pray that I can follow. Later in the article, 
and it's important to remember, this is back in 1949. This guy's not a Democrat. He's not a, I don't know his political party. This is decades ago. Decades ago. Again, a warning to, to all of us, but particularly the medical community. Alexander says, quote, and he's referring to American physicians, they have arrived at a danger point in thinking at which likelihood of full rehabilitation is considered a factor that should determine the amount of time, effort, and cost to be devoted to a particular type of patient on the part of the social body upon which this decision rests. At this point, Americans should remember that the enormity of the euthanasia movement is present in their own midst. In other words, Dr. Alexander is saying that the American medical culture will become a culture of death, a throwaway culture captive to euthanasia for the most vulnerable if the quality of care of a patient receives is based primarily on the likelihood of full recovery or is based primarily on the ability of the patient to be useful in the future or is based primarily on the financial cost of caring for the very sick. Tragically, much of Dr. Alexander's warnings from 1949 have been forgotten, and much, perhaps not all, but much of his fears, I believe, to some extent, have become true. Over time in our country, the profit motive that values patients primarily as objects of profit, combined with the growing atheistic secularism that values the human person primarily based on his or her usefulness to society, this profit motive, this objectification of the human person has driven much of love and charity out of the healthcare system. When human beings are turned to objects of the economy or objects of society or objects of the state, they cease to be infinitely valuable human beings and become problems to be discarded for convenience sake. This belief that certain inconvenient human beings can or should be discarded, in part led to the legalization of abortion and the fur further collapse of human dignity in healthcare. Abortion, again, is the intentional killing of an unborn child. It does violence not only to the unborn child, but also to the pregnant mother. In the United States alone, the abortion industry has killed over 60 million 60 million unborn children, all sacred human beings. It's estimated, the last time I checked, that well over 10 million, and it may be over 15 million, of these unborn children who were killed were African American, a disproportionate number. It's not too far-fetched to call it a black genocide. Here in Michigan, and I have to bring this up, I, when we started talking about this, I, I, you know, this was not on the radar. But I, I, I'm duty-bound to bring this up. Here in Michigan, you have Proposition 3, an abortion ballot initiative on the ballot this November for you all to consider that would do the following according to the Diocese of Grand Rapids website. It would do the following. And I'm just quoting. Allow abortion up until birth, allow minors to pursue abortions and sterilizations without parental notification or consent, exempt abortion facilities from basic health and safety regulations, allow anyone to perform an abortion even if they don't have a medical license, protect abortion providers from penalties for killing or injuring a woman during an abortion, allow abortion for anyone at any age, including minors, allow abortion any time up to the moment of birth and beyond birth, allow abortion anywhere in a medical facility or any other location. So that's for you all to consider this November. This abortion ballot initiative will lead to the killing of innumerable unborn children and it will harm countless pregnant mothers. The ballot initiative will also catapult the collapse of human dignity and civil rights in Michigan's healthcare system. It will be destructive for all of us. This ballot initiative passed will cause the life and health of the poor, the vulnerable, and patients with disabilities to be at greater risk of discrimination and bias. 
the civil rights movement restored the American promise of equality under the law and was founded upon moral and religious convictions about the human dignity of every single person, no matter what. The civil rights movement was based on moral and religious beliefs about love of God and neighbor and the equal value of all human life. That's the civil rights movement. Tragically, along with the erosion of human dignity within the healthcare system in America, we are witnessing right now a stunning attack on the rights of medical conscience and religious freedom. Medical conscience and religious freedom are civil rights that safeguard, and we talked about this with the students, conscience and religious freedom safeguard the freedom to love, the freedom to pour ourselves out for others in our professional and personal vocations, the freedom of medical professionals, religious orders, faith-based and even secular healthcare entities to care for the sick and the suffering consistent with their well-formed and religious convictions about the dignity and the sanctity of the human person. Under the current presidential administration, in just roughly the last three months since the historic Supreme Court decision in the Dobbs case, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services under this administration has done the following. It's issued a, regula a regulatory guidance document coercing emergency departments nationwide to perform abortions in certain circumstances across the country right now. They've also issued a regulatory guidance document coercing pharmacists nationwide to prescribe abortive patients under certain circumstances right now. And the current administration at HHS has issued a new proposed regulation that would mandate the performance of unethical and harmful transgender procedures while also laying the groundwork for a potential abortion mandate throughout healthcare. These actions by the current presidential administration would crush, would crush the First Amendment. I think it's unlawful, it's unconstitutional, but the reality is, is if these things went into full force, the regulatory guidance documents I mentioned are in force today, right now. But these things together in total would crush medical conscience and religious freedom in healthcare, and if successful, would effectively outlaw Catholic healthcare in the United States. There's no way that Catholic medical entities, hospitals, clinics could practice in this environment. They would have to shut down and sell off. There's no way. And particularly whether we're in the pandemic or it's over, that's not for me to decide. But the reality is, is that we still have some level of a, of a public health challenge with COVID. And are we really going to shut down uh, Catholic healthcare, with, which in the aggregate provides care uh, to something approaching around 15 to 17% of all Americans, often poor and vulnerable? I don't think so. That's not the way to go. That's not how we push healthcare access. It's not how we uh, respect the Constitution. It's not how we uphold human dignity for the most vulnerable. If we strip medical conscience and the exercise of religious beliefs and the sanctity of life from healthcare, human dignity as the driving force behind healthcare will collapse. And the new driver in the healthcare industry will become the profit motive in which human beings deem less valuable because of race or ethnicity or sex or physical disability or material poverty, they'll become expendable. As I have written, if we take medical conscience, religious freedom, and the right to life out of the healthcare system, other civil rights, the right to be free of discrimination in the healthcare system based on age, race, ethnicity, language, or inability to pay, these things will collapse. Civil rights in healthcare, human dignity in healthcare will collapse. We'll be stripping love, charity, conscience, and the sanctity of life out of healthcare.
It'll be all about business, profits, and power. Now, as tough as these things are, in my estimation, these things are really tough. This is not about projecting five years from now. I'm talking about today. These are, these are realities. The uh, ballot proposal that you all will be considering, I'm not a, a Michigan voter, I live in the DC area. Um, this is serious stuff. This ballot proposal will fundamentally change Michigan. It's also not who Michigan is. But I'm hopeful. I'm always hopeful. There's always cause for Christian hope. Jesus Christ is here among us, always, always working. He's moving, always. He's always moving to free the captives, heal the brokenhearted, heal the sick, inwardly and outwardly. I stand before you as a man who's, because of my own sin and failures, I'm deserving of death. I really am. But God has rescued me and is rescuing, if we take the invitation, all of us, for life eternal with him. All of our hurts, all of our brokenness, all of our struggles. He's here if we encounter him. And that's why I have hope. I also firmly believe that God, who is love, is moving to empower our country to be a civilization of love and justice for all as we're called to be. It's not about political party. It's not being a conservative or a liberal. And particularly at Hope College, and I'm gonna say we, since I'm amongst your community at least today, we're called to just be Christians, period, period. The Holy Spirit is always moving. God is always working to counter the culture of death with a new culture of life, love, and justice, and healthcare in which all God's children, all God's children, especially the most vulnerable, those most in need of God's love and mercy are cared for, uplifted, healed, restored to the fullness of God's given dignity for each person. I said this at Ivory University a couple weeks ago. God wants his children back, all of them. And it doesn't matter how they're attracted. It doesn't matter what they look like, where they're from, how, they're, how, they, how they worship, to God. I think everyone should be Catholic again. But God wants everybody. God wants everybody. He wants to love everybody. And who cares about party or power or politics? It's all about love. It is about love with the Lord. And that's what I see happening. That, that response to that message is what I see happening in the United States. Even though things are tough, number one, and I ask you to pray for the, these folks. We're not in Nigeria where literally Catholic priests are being killed seemingly every month. Real red martyrdom every month in Nigeria. Not even close to that. Not even close to that. But we have our challenges here in America, and I see God on the move. The Christ Medicus Foundation through the power of the Holy Spirit, is co-leading a movement with our allies for what we're calling a new birth of civil rights and healthcare through public policy that protects the sanctity of all life and that protects particularly the civil rights of medical conscience and religious freedom and healthcare. The right to life and conscience and religious freedom are three pillars upon which all other civil rights depend. And we're happy with our allies to promote and educate those vital fundamental civil rights that are necessary for all other rights to flourish. Additionally, through the Holy Spirit, numerous leaders in the pro-life healthcare movement are working to reform the education and training of medical professionals and healthcare administrators to return that training to sound moral ethics steeped in the natural law and in the biological scientific reality that human life starts at conception and should be protected until natural death. I'm really excited about the amazing work of the National Catholic Bioethics Center, which anyone that's in the healthcare profession should learn about. They're doing amazing work. It's a leader in bioethics for really the whole globe. 
We've also had the Catholic Healthcare Leadership Alliance, which is a new voice for Catholic healthcare in the United States that we we founded earlier this year. And we also have the work of Catholic Health International in partnership with Benedictine College to found a new medical school named after St. Padre Pio. The Holy Spirit is doing tremendous work through Christ Medicus Foundation, our allies also, and we need this, we've always needed, to expand pro-life medical centers to provide needed and valuable care for vulnerable pregnant women and their unborn children. We're also seeing a new springtime amongst Christ-centered healthcare and healing ministries. An infusion of the work of Christian healthcare with ministries like Encounter that are allowing people to really encounter the Holy Spirit so that they can perhaps get physical healing, but even more important, receive the spiritual healing that everyone needs. We see these seemingly disparate but very similar groups, Catholic healthcare, Christian healthcare, and healing ministries coming together to care for the whole person, the integrated health of every person, for individuals and families. And we're seeing this happen through spiritual healing retreats, increased availability of spiritual direction, and increased access to Catholic mental health counseling, particularly I think about the great work of Divine Mercy University, the Catholic Graduate School for Mental Health in Northern Virginia. And I have to tell you about what we're doing uh, at, at Christ Medicus, and I hope maybe some of you all will consider taking advantage of it because it's transforming lives. This is, and I'll, I'll close uh, right about here. Our Curo Catholic Healthcare community at Christ Medicus, again, we have members in about 40 states, is helping our members to heal. We care about the body, but we care even more about the soul. We're helping folks heal through Catholic health coaching to improve physical health, through spiritual direction with a trained spiritual director who's also a wonderful uh, bioethicist, and a spiritual health program based on the remarkable work of Dr. Bob Schutz and the John Paul II Healing Center out of Tallahassee, Florida, that helps person experience greater spiritual healing through a deeper encounter with Jesus Christ. God came for your hearts, and we we are called, if we're called to be leaders, we're called to be instruments of God coming into healing, infusing, and restoring the hearts of our brothers and sisters. And that's some of the work that we're doing at Christ Medicus. One of my heroes, St. John Paul II, famously said, and it's changed the course of my career, The common outcry, which is justly made on behalf of human rights, for example, the right to health, to home, to work, to family, to culture, is false and illusory if the right to life, the most basic and fundamental right and the condition of all other personal rights, is not defended with maximum determination. And so even while there are challenges, I have great hope. I've definitely fallen into despair at times, from time to time. But I have great hope because our Lord, the God of love and justice, is on the move. And so I ask you all, in your personal professional vocations, you are called to love. You are called to lead others to Christ. You are called to be a hero through depending on him and, and getting every soul back to the Lord. There's a, there's a beautiful film called Harriet. And uh, it's about Harriet Tubman. And she was an important part of the Underground Railroad. And they show in the film, and one of the uh, women who was involved in the production of the film believes it to be true based on Harriet Tubman's own writings, that she depended upon the Lord, the Holy Spirit, we would say, to find her way out of the plantation in Maryland and literally walk to freedom. She literally listened to God and the Lord told her where to go. She had no idea where she was going. And she made it to Pennsylvania and was free. And so did she stay in Pennsylvania and just enjoy her freedom and just praise the Lord that she was saved Praise the Lord that she was liberated from slavery. She didn't. 
she went back in. She went back into the slave states and rescued her brothers and sisters. As a bishop once told me, the call of Vatican II is to not simply, and I'm paraphrasing, be in relationship with the Lord and say, I'm all fine and good, but it's to go back in like Harriet Tubman did and to rescue our brothers and sisters from the gates of hell. You're called to heroic leadership by loving God and bringing your brothers and sisters back to him. So that is my prayer and hope for you and your profession and your personal and professional vocations that you can even more so as you go forward be an instrument for the Lord so that all God's people may know of God's love for them, that all people may know and experience through you who God is calling to be his instruments even more to live the freedom of the children of God. Thank you. Take your questions. Thank you for that. Uh, it was great to hear. Um, so it sounded like there are three active parties, if I understood correctly, that there are the religious hospitals, which I know that the church is the mother of hospitals and it takes a lot of nuns, saintly nuns, to you know, help those people. Um, then there's also these for-profit hospitals, more secular groups, and then the government. Um, and I had a mentor here at college that taught me how the for-profit motive, while it can be easily misunderstood, and perhaps uh, avarice can take over and be used for evil, that can also lead to some good, uh, looking at the mm -hmm. classical liberal school, um, that businesses that operate by the for-profit motive give them the incentives to make good decisions, rational decisions. So do you think that, well, and if I may also step back a moment, the government, um, because they are the furthest removed under the principle of subsidiarity uh, from the health and the, li the decisions of just people such as you and I, it sounds like the government is more so the issue when they try to impose these regulatory um, things uh, or laws, executive orders, whatever you want to call them, on both the religious hospitals and the secular hospitals. But the question is more so, do you think that fundamentally a secular hospital should not really be able to operate because they operate under a for-profit motive and therefore they would not do their job as well as a religious hospital? Yeah, no, I think that's a good question and a good clarification. I, I think that, um, you know, part of what we do at Christ Medicus even with some of our uh, allies and collaborators is just look at financial sustainability. And there's absolutely nothing wrong. And in fact, it's even just and appropriate for uh, any enterprise to want to be financially sustainable, you know? Uh, and so there's nothing, in my opinion, there's nothing inherently wrong uh, with a for-profit uh, healthcare enterprise or a for-profit medical clinic whatsoever. Um, the, the bigger issue to me is what's the primary motivation in, in truth and in reality? Is the primary motivation uh, mere profit or is the primary motivation uh, to alleviate suffering, to care for those who are sick? Um, what we'll find, like a big challenge, I, there's a friend of mine I haven't seen in years, African-American guy, lives in North Carolina, uh, married, highly educated. Uh, I think he's got a PhD now, and his wife has a, a, you know advanced degree. They're probably both upper middle class. And, um, and he's been going to his primary care physician for you know, at least a couple years. So he goes in with his primary care physician. I think he gets, you know, less than 10 minutes. From what I can remember, maybe it was five minutes. He's been going there for a couple years. The doctor does, this is his annual checkup, very basic, a very basic exam, and says, don't I know you from somewhere? And then says, hey, okay, you're okay. I'll see you in a year. A lot of the healthcare industry has... Um, created a structure where the norm, not all the time, and I'm not a physician, you know, I'm a lawyer, but what I've seen, 
is enormous seven minutes with the pace and or, you know, small increments. From what I've seen with my own care, at my, you know, I'm, I'm still a very young and, and when I'm in a little bit better shape, I look even younger, but uh, you know, I'm only 40. But I see the difference. I, I do direct primary care where I just pay cash with my primary care physician. We'll spend 30 minutes, 40. He's, in, he's able to go into detail. My care has been superior because of the amount of time that I'm, that I'm able to have with, uh, with my doctor. And when, when the health of the patient is kind of a secondary consideration, um, the time that uh, a physician and a patient's able to spend uh, often diminishes, decreases, and the care isn't that good because the physician doesn't have the awareness, the knowledge about the patient. They don't really have, it comes down to, to an extent, as one of our co-founders says, some level of relationship. I don't, if I don't know about you, I can't care for you. If I don't know what's going on for you. So the profit motive is not only permiss permissible from, from Christian thought and from justice, but it's necessary. Uh, you know, financial sustainability, uh, to some extent, is necessary. People have to provide for each other. Um, but it shouldn't be the primary driver uh, of healthcare in an enterprise or, or in the aggregate healthcare system in the United States. That's my opinion. So, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Sure, definitely, yep. You just beautifully summarized it, but what do we do? Um, I mean, I came to a place with a girl in Washington at a school there where I just finally said, I think you need to talk to a lawyer because I've written this letter three times. I filled out forms. It was accepted last year. It's not accepted this year. And she does have valid medical reasoning, but I don't even care if she does. Personally, I think it should be her choice. So can you just touch a little bit more on the choice, the medical Yeah, no, I, I think that's a good question and because there's like, you know, I mean, if this was a year ago, anyway, I was going to try to make a joke, but, um, you know, <laughs> there, there's just so much going on and I just, I could have gone there, but I just decided to focus on, but I think it's important, you know, um, uh, you know, um, I knew a guy in Michigan, uh, in Detroit, I hadn't seen him in years, but he died the first week in a COVID, he was in his 40s. Um, my mom, first couple weekends, knew tons of, not about tons, but numerous folks that she taught with, you know, uh, that lived in different parts, mostly African-American, lived in different parts of the Detroit area, that were in the hospital or that died the first couple weeks of COVID. Um, I mean, definitely like a real thing. It's serious, you know. Um, but I think that the, the idea that it's permissible to coerce Patients to receive medical interventions is crazy. It is, it's crazy. It's crazy. I mean, because if, if we have, if we're saying that uh, generally uh, the government uh, has the ability to uh, prescribe, to, to coerce us to take certain medical interventions, maybe that's okay in a, in a world that's propped up by uh, the you know Abrahamic traditions, Judeo-Christian values about dignity and all that to some extent now, but what happens in a sec secular atheistic world that's all about outcomes 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now? Um, that's a very dangerous place. What authority, what limiting principle is there on government power? Um, and so I think it's, it's important uh, that uh, the church uh, that the church, the Christian church, generally does a better job of balancing uh, legitimate and just concerns about public health crisis. And there's, we have responsibilities to, uh, to, to our neighbor to, uh, you know, to help them to, 
uh, to be healthy and, and to not spread disease, and we have responsibilities and moral duties there. Um, uh, but we also have uh, a, a just and appropriate authority uh, over our, over our uh, bodies to um, determine uh, the medical care that we receive. And uh, the church needs to do a better job, generally, about that. The Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith had a great statement in December of 20, I think it was, uh, but it was, I think, practically disregarded by too much of the church. That really mattered. It really hurt that, that it wasn't done correctly. The second thing is we need, um, in this country, greater protections for patients and medical professionals around conscience rights. Conscience rights are not absolute. They're not absolute, but they're important, and we can't just run over them. Uh, so I don't have a great answer for what to do. I do think that uh, First Liberty Institute, I believe, in Texas, law firm doing great work to defend patients' conscience rights. ADF uh, uh, is doing great work on medical conscience rights more broadly. Uh, they, I don't know whether they've gotten into the vaccine issue, but uh, you know, I'm not doing, getting into the efficacy of vaccines. That's not my role. I'm not a physician. Uh, but I, I do believe in and our faith would ch tell us, and reason would dictate, uh, that uh, one of the most fundamental freedoms for human beings is to determine the care uh, that they receive. So. What's your thoughts on universal health care? Sure, yeah. So, um, no, it's an interesting question, <laughs> you know. Um, I've thought a lot about it uh, in my life. Um, on, the, on the one hand, I think that um, there is a, I believe because of the right to life that there is a right to medical care. And the church has taught that for, you know, the church, and I'm speaking about the Catholic church specifically, through the, through, through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the bishop's teaching office, they've taught that, you know, there's, there's a right to medical care. Um, that doesn't mean that, that government has to provide that. I think that the, the way that we provide health care in a civil society is a prudential matter. It's not getting to a place of faith and morals. Uh, and so, you know, if it was like, uh, you know, I'm kind of joking here, but, you know, Poland's a super, uh, you know, fairly Catholic culture, believes in human dignity, uh, you know, not perfect. They have their own challenges there too, but if it was like 1920, you know, 19, I don't know, 1890, whenever the Republic of Poland was still Poland, it wasn't Russia or whatever, um, you know, government, healthcare, uh, you know, in, in the past, in a civilization that is just and respecting human dignity from conception to natural death, maybe that's a, a just prudential decision that a civil society can make. My fear and why I think government uh, controlled or single payer healthcare would be a disaster would be that it would be, it would be a delivery mechanism for the culture of death. I think most of the healthcare system is given over uh, to a lot of these challenges and um, dignity, freedom, all these issues I talked about, I think would get much worse. On the other hand though, uh, given that, it is up to, you know, it, I should say this too, and, and this is why like I, you know, it's important to just be a Christian. I think that you know, the virtue of selfishness on Ron completely contrary to the gospel. It is the antithesis of the gospel. Government has a proper role in uh, supporting the delivery of healthcare to its citizens. Um, but I think it is, it is one of, it should be one of the uh, providers, uh, one of the institutions that empowers additional care to its citizens along with uh, private industry, along with the family and faith-based institution, uh, it should be a, uh, a unified front through all the institutions of civil society, uh, not just government, ideally, which is, again, some of this, and I hope I'm not going on too long, I, you know, I guess I'm okay, but um, the principle of, and maybe you're super familiar with this, and, but the principle of subsidiarity, if, if I'm in, if, if Johnny's house on fire and Johnny's in California, and I'm here in Hope College, I can't really help Johnny. Now, I can pray for him, and so I can help him that way. But if, I'm, if Johnny's in, uh, you know, if he's in 
San Clarita, California, and I'm also too in San Clarita, California. Uh, I'm closer to the problem. I can help him more potently, more directly. And so some of that is that principle of subsidiarity that um, those that are closest to the problem, the church, the family, the community, the city, the state, um, have a greater obligation to help solve the problem. Um, partially because um, when we are closer and nearer to each other, the potency of our capacity to love is much greater. And so that's that principle of subsidiarity, and, and I think that it's, it's really important. And, and part, chiefly, chiefly, not because of any left-right dynamic, but chiefly because those that are closer um, know better and can love better and, and more potently and powerfully support, help, care, love, that kind of thing. So, yeah. So just for context, I have my mom is an ER charge nurse, and then my two siblings are both finishing residency right now. And a lot of times they come to me with this concern of like, I need to not, like they have to like plan out that they're not gonna have kids for another four or five years because residency is like piling debt on top of them until they like can't breathe. And we've, we've already established, right? Like obviously people who go to the medical profession for the astounding majority are good people who want to serve. How does the cost of education corrupt yeah, that I, to the point yeah. of like, then they want the profit, you know? Yeah. Because if you're buried in the amount of debt, you have to go profit first or else like you just stop. No, so I, and that's, that no, that's a great point, which I haven't really thought much about, but I think it's a big deal. And it's understandable, the pressures on, on medical debt, which is, from what I can see, much worse than uh, even law school debt. And I, I think something needs to be done about that. I do not know what that is. <laughs> but it's a great point. I think you're right. I think it's a big issue. Thank you. This has been a wonderful talk. Thank you. I have a, you mentioned something that just made me think. Um, you mentioned that we know by faith that all life is sacred. I think one verse I've heard is Genesis 127. Yeah. What, like for dialoguing with people who might say, oh, you're just religious, what kind of literature would you recommend for by reason we can know all life is sacred? Yeah. Um, I would look at the work of Hadley Arcus. He's a professor at Amherst, Amherst College, or former professor, professor emeritus at Amherst College. He's now at the James Madison Institute. He's done a lot of work on like um, natural law, natural rights. Uh, I think his work is helpful. Um, there's an amazing man that I had the gift of knowing his wife a little bit. And I would love it if the medical and the nursing and everyone that's wanted to go to healthcare would learn about this man. His name is um, uh, Professor or Dr. Jerome Lejeune. Anybody heard of him? Jerome Lejeune. Okay, great. So he discovered, and one of the students corrected me, um, the, the, he discovered the chromosome uh, for trisomy 21. He was considered one of the, you know, maybe the best geneticist of his, of his time. Uh, he got numerous awards, including one from uh, President Kennedy at the time, and uh, would have gotten probably a Nobel Prize but gave a uh, pro-life speech, I believe, in San Francisco and, and kind of lost it after that, lost the opportunity. He didn't lose it as in he didn't lose it, you know, but he lost the prize, right, kind of after that happened. And uh, I had the gift of knowing his amazing uh, wife a little bit, and um, he had a very close relationship with John Paul II. Uh, we now have the Jerome Lejeune Foundation in France and has a presence in the United States. They provide some of the best care in the world for um, patients with uh, Down syndrome, who I would argue patients with Down syndrome um, are actually some of the best of us. Uh, uh, they're some of the very best of us, um, uh, of, of humanity, and in many ways much better, almost in the most important measure, I think better than, better than we are. Um, but he, he, there's a beautiful video where he talks about that in, in science, and I think in particular, um, in like genetic code, that there's a message. 
about the person. You know, from the, from the second of conception, there's a message. And there's details about who that person is becoming. It's all right there at conception. Bam. I, did I say anything about God or religion? No. There's a, there's a human reality that is unique and dynamic and unrepeatable. And there's all this detail and information embedded in that human person, all there, all just becoming. Um, and so, you know, I think I've been very inspired by him. Uh, his, uh, <laughs> his wife, uh, and God rest her soul, she passed away a couple years ago. Uh, she was uh, very, in my opinion, very humorous. She was in her early 90s, smoked every day, you know, uh, smoked tobacco every day. And it was fascinating just being around uh, a woman whose husband uh, was already a servant of God. They opened the cause of his canonization. Now he's venerable. So, um, so, but I think, I think Hadley Arcus, I think looking into uh, the, some of the work of uh, Dr. Jerome Lejeune, some of the work of the Lejeune Foundation, uh, also some of the work of the Charlotte Lozier Institute, um, it, it's just very, it's very, very clear. Um, you know, and I, I, wanna, I wanna share something as well with you and I think I'm really, I really enjoy talking to folks that are a little younger than I am. So I think, I hope I still have five minutes, I don't know. But, um, but this is tragic. We were talking about this earlier. Uh, in the 80s, folks that had Down syndrome were everywhere. They were, and we remember, you remember. It was wonderful. Uh, my first job at a movie theater, Birmingham Theater in, uh, in, in Birmingham, Michigan. Anyone been to the Birmingham Theater? A couple people, okay. You know, uh, one of my, I think her name was Erin, uh, one of my, you know, colleagues, I was 14, 15, she, she um, I, I'm fairly positive, she, had, she, she was a person with Down syndrome. Um, I had friends who, I had at least one friend, one of my debate team uh, uh, members, his sister had Down syndrome. It was normal. Where are they now? They're gone. There's some. There's some, right? But they're not here like they should be. We have been deprived of some of the most amazing people. That is tragic. It is. It haunts me. And that's some of what we're up against, you know? That's some of what we're up against. So anyway... I don't know if there's another question. Hi. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so my concern is that as we continue to do health, Catholic health care and live by the morals and virtues that we want. I mean, we want to help. There's this group of people who just want to help and serve. But yet, we're challenged all the time with people coming in, baiting us. You know, mm -hmm. baiting us. Sure. And, and um, you know, I, that's a fear that I have because at what point, at, it's going to come. Mm -hmm. At what point do they want women's health care, but they're asking me to compromise. Sure. But they're doing it under the auspices of civil rights. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it's, so what do we do to protect or to, I don't know if we can't even protect ourselves, but do you have any advice in terms of that? Yeah, I think, um, I, have, I do, and some of this is going to sound a little hokey, but, um, and I'm not a physician, so I have such respect for physicians that I am not one and not, you know, horrible at biology, horrible at science, but um, uh, I think a couple things. I think that I think real prayer, like putting on the armor in the morning, and we should all be doing that, but putting on the armor of the Lord in the morning so that I can love that patient no matter what I'm getting. Um, Dr. Rusty Shavey uh, at Emmaus Health, who's a friend of mine uh, and runs Emmaus Health, which is a wonderful uh, medical center in Ann Arbor. They do great care. Um, he's really good about, okay, how do I just love, you know, that focus of loving the patient? Um, I think being involved with the Catholic Medical Association uh, is really important because there's strength in numbers from these things, which is essentially what you're talking about. It's kind of like a sting, right? 
Um, I think being involved with us in Christ Medicus and the Catholic Healthcare Leadership Alliance so that we can, um, you know, that we can again grow and, and, and have strength in numbers so that the body of Christ can present the world um, uh, authentic love in healthcare because uh, love authentically is so beautiful uh, and is so irresistible uh, that, that um, you can't resist, you know? Um, so I think that's important. I think having access to a good lawyer um, with, with, you know, is, is important. Uh, being, being connected. I think the being connected in community, uh, both with institutions like the, the, uh, the Catholic Healthcare Leadership Alliance, we're thinking about all these things, um, uh, like Christ, Christ Medicus Foundation, I think are very important. The Catholic, I should have put CMA up here, but I think, I think that's vital. Part of what I wanted to tell folks tonight um, and I, you know, I hope you all may know this brilliant people here, but these things are, are all, uh, I can't say it enough, it's all connected. I can't think that I'm fine when the other person's not okay. Um, a th- you know, it's, it's the often misused quote of, of Dr. King that a threat to uh, justice, an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And so these things, it's not left or right, it's not conservative or liberal, it's not about Trump. There's deeper things going on. Um, and so the, the call is to just be a Christian. And that's the challenge, it's like, okay, what is civil rights really? What, what, which comes down to, and Ryan Anderson, who's a friend of mine, he does a good job of talking about this, it's about justice. It's about true justice, not human justice. Not I, you owe me, I owe you, uh, you know, is it, is it Tice? Yes. Tice gives me five, I give him five back. That's not justice. That's not, that's not Christian justice. Christian justice is divine justice, which says, I owe you what you're due, I owe you love. That's what civil rights has to be based on. But it's being distorted, it's being co-opted, and so we have to, we have to take it back, we have to reclaim it. So that's what I think. Thank you.